Good morning to you, church. If you're a visitor and you have kids with you, you'll see they're busy herding out. If they would like to go, they welcome. Now's the time. So this morning, I would like to challenge us a little bit around our perception of our need to grow. And how do we grow? But first, I thought I'd open with, this isn't a joke this time, but it's, it's some kind of a joke. I'll prepare the teens because you seem to be here in larger numbers. This is very much in the dad joke range. So get ready to eye roll me properly, okay? When a new post commander arrived at an army base, he was surprised to see a couple of his soldiers standing sentry over an empty bench. That means they're standing at attention next to It seemed like an odd thing for soldiers to be doing, so he asked the sergeant who had been on base for a few years why the bench was being guarded. I don't know why, the sergeant said, but I've heard we've had men assigned to that bench for the past 35 years. The post commander dug back through personal files, found the name of the man who was in charge 35 years ago and grabbed the phone and called him up. Um, Hi, I'm the new post commander, and my question for you, he said, why is the bench so heavily guarded? The old retiree was shocked. He said, you mean the paint still isn't dry? (laughs) So there's two profound lessons to be learned from this. Firstly, that repetition is not necessarily good. The reason why we repeat something is the, the result that we're looking for. And then something that's really sad, which to me this describes the church at the moment, is we have soldiers that are invested in for purpose, and what are they doing? They're guarding a bench. Now, any person that is of an age that went to the army and actually did some fighting, how much do they care what the condition of that bench is when the bullets are flying? So there's something that's beautiful about the army is they help instill principle and, and um, so there would be values in, in behind this that is missing from my analogy. But what I'm getting at here is that soldiers are trained for purpose. And when the church is lulled into a false sense of security, it starts to guard things of zero significance. And one of these things is, I believe, the very real need for each individual to actually advance their own personal growth in God. He has a quote from Jonathan Edwards. A true and faithful Christian does not make holy living an accidental thing. It is his great concern as the business of the soldier is to fight. So the business of the Christian is to be like Christ. So how do we do this? Because I believe the church is in this place where we actually guard in benches, it's not that we don't have an appreciation for the things of God. And we've got our fancy quotes. I've been around a few sporting events, and I was reminded in watching some of the boys play rugby and then Annika yesterday, a mountain biking race. And there's these sayings that every sport has got. You know, like when you're standing on the sidelines, you hear them, push it, boy, push it. I mean, it can be at any moment in time. You could really be standing at the tuck shop and and the donuts going in, you know. It's just something that you can hear next to the side of the field, you know. Get down, get down. You know, there's all these, push it now. And you'll hear dad shouting these sayings at even the wrong time, but they're in it. And so as Christians, we learn these words to make us feel like we're part of something which we should be part of, but the value of what we are saying, when we need to say it, how we work out our lives, I believe needs to be fundamentally grounded in the word of God and the personal responsibility to actually put that in needs to be each and every person. There's something that I absolutely loved about playing in teams is when you play in team, you learn to have to trust somebody else that they might actually drop the ball. It deals with our personal control issues. We don't like to lose. We don't like to put our life in the hands of other people. But there's a great skill to be learned out of that. 
and it is something that Wyatt, whether he likes whatever it is, there will be a certain component that for this lesson alone would like him to participate. Whatever it is, but he needs to be able to become comfortable with the fact of playing in team. Why? Because when I read my Bible, it says that he is given gifts. And until the unity of the faith, the ability to work together happens, this thing that he's given us to do will not be successful. And that is a sobering reality. Now, if you read your Bible, then you would also be aware of that scripture. And it's something in what I'm getting at this morning, that if we acquire an appetite for it, which is the first point, we would start to develop the things that God loves, we would love also. Don't you find it interesting that every person born has to learn even the most mundane things from scratch? Okay. So what does this really imply? Learning is a God-given gift. It's not a curse. So every baby that's born, I mean, why don't you just kind of do like an advanced evolution? Like you come with this little boop, plug in and at least you get a teenager that doesn't profess to know everything. And you start there. Why, why is it that this input thing is so, so important? So I want to encourage us in saying, a lot of our kids, when they're saying they don't like school, it's not that they're saying we don't like to learn. What they're saying is we don't like how we're being taught. I'm not remotely suggesting that your kids get to determine how they learn. That is what our culture is teaching us at the moment. It's saying let your kids decide how they want to learn, which leads to destruction. The Bible's order says that the older will teach the younger, Correct. Value systems eroding. Let me not go off point because I can get distracted with that. <laughs> so it's not a curse. It's a gift. It is by God's design. Proverbs 2, 1 to 6 reads as the following. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, what I'd want you to consider is how they writing. You know, when you are somebody like me that writes a letter or something, I just want you to get this thing. Do what I tell you, maybe. Consider yourself when you write. These guys are wanting you to understand fully and completely a concept with every letter that's put down on this page. Every word is leading towards something that you are they're saying, is worth writing in the living book. Isn't that true? So when he's saying here, my son, he's drawing attention, even in the great cosmos design of God, is that you are beloved, you are his. You are not some distant person. You are his. You are bought with a price. You belong to him. If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, he's talking about if is implying a condition. It's not saying that just because you are my son that you would, it's saying, my son, beloved, my choice. If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, implying work needs to be done by you and I, and incline your heart, meaning you will need to brush that thing up, you will need to apply energy and effort to understanding means working out the difficult components of life to get to a place, firstly, that's loyal to God and understanding what he means with his perspective on the subject at hand. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, which means effort, which means no trophy for participation, it means applying yourself and again restoring the, the, the great work that we need to do. We must understand that our entire culture is primed in this day and age to erode the very fundamentals of the gospel. Let's take a really simple um, subject, which is really, really touchy, and I use it with purpose. Who decided that disciplining your child with the hand was, was incorrect? Have you thought about that? Who decided that? Does the Bible not instruct it? Does it not say if you do this, you might save his very soul? So consider what is the enemy's fundamental plan is to keep you from him. 
and you would consider all the defense mechanisms that you've been taught through the world, why this is not a good idea. Not a one would rush to a loyalty with God first to work it out in the way that scripture demands. So we're living in a society that is scampering away from God in this, assuming that our way is better than the one that designed us. That is not by intent, meaning I'm not presuming that the people sitting in this room have got this devious intent, but a cultural bias, meaning the ones that have trained us, which is scripturally accurate, that says train them in the way they should go, and they will not depart from it. Meaning, if you acquire information in this process that is a God-given gift for you to learn, you might end up being bent. Our only saving hope is if we channel ourselves back towards God and the things that we do not agree with with God, hear me very carefully, it's okay to disagree with God. As a start, because God said this to us, he said, even though you were dead in your transgressions, I called you out, which means while you were advancing in rebellion against me, I still sent my son, he still obeyed me to lay down his life so that I might have you restored to me. God is not hindered, God is not intimidated or upset with our sinfulness. He's aware that it's there, but what he's done is he said through the laying down of my son's life, you don't have to stay there. Therefore, it is no longer tolerated. But if you start with God, I do not see the value in this, but I humble myself before you. You are the author of life. I give you permission to grant me the insights I need that I might become loyal to you in mind and heart and deed. Trusting full well what this scripture is saying is that the end result of it would be God is glorified and I be the beneficiary of it. Amen. Phew. Is it working, the recording? Because I don't know that I'm going to do that again. Okay. (laughs) Number two, be teachable. Never stop learning. Here's a quote from Henry Ford. Who knows who he is? He made Mercedes. (laughs) Blush (laughs) with his success. Anyone who stops learning is old. Let that sink in a little bit. Why do I stop there, pause intentionally, is because I believe that the older generation, if you're 50 and up, has the greatest value to add in this church. Why do I say 50? Because 50 is the beginning of you processing what the end will look like. Isn't that correct? You start considering what does your life left look like versus still like I've got endless amounts of life to live. And so I start with you in saying the challenge that you'll face is you'll start making decisions of what you want your life to look like and what you've inputted will be what you aim at. Whatever you've valued and whatever you've loved, it doesn't mean what I'm saying now is the deciding of your end. What I'm giving us the opportunity to do is to assess. If you're not happy with where you're aiming, if your life end goal is is for retirement and not adding value, you can still redeem the time. While you still have breath in your lungs, I believe God can use us. Let's consider, what's the guy's name that pulled the whole house down? He was so funny. Samson. So in his dying minutes, he pulled that whole place down in an effort for God. I mean, that was one last heave-ho and it was done. So, I believe that our lives can add value right to the very end. There's no reason that you should get bound and go, I'm 80, I've only got one. Stop that and just consider, God, here is my life. You, the most high God, do with it what you will. So anyone who stops learning is old. Here's a trick or a thing to help yourself. How old are your stories? When we, if you use the term when we, stop yourself and find another adventure. So you can say, yesterday, (laughs) so here's the challenge to you in that is consider some great moments in your life, because there are some benchmarks that they never die. When I got saved, the day I got married, the day my son was born, the day I took over the leading of this church. Those, those in their interaction are historical monuments to God. 
always talk about them. You'll actually find yourself not wanting to speak about them because you'll feel like you, you're bragging about yourself. If it brings glory to God, shout it from the hilltops because the guy next to you still has to get there and he will have a hope in your story. Those are the ones you share unapologetically and I'll listen to any old person that's got a war story like that. But consider the ones that are just the ones that you just did life. And they come out and they come out. Those are the ones that you stop and you realize, hey, I need to go and live a little. Find a young person, I'll show you how to do it. Because we forget. The Bible tells us to continually remember. Make room for the old guys, young people. They're not done yet. It's a value in the life of this church. Whether at 20 or 80, this was the quote, anyone who stops learning is old, whether he's at 20 or at 80. Anyone who keeps learning stays young. The greatest thing in life is to keep your mind young. Henry Ford said that. It is really necessary. We have advanced so much as people. Do we really have to apply ourselves to learning and growing and learning in the things of God? Yes, absolutely we do. And the reason for that I believe we can find in 2 Timothy, which might almost be unnecessary because I think now more than ever, we are living in the fruit of our investment as a nation and as a world. So we might want to distance ourselves and saying, I'm not guilty of those things. But here's a great truth is that we have been called by God as disciples to advance the kingdom. So what this means in a business context is we are all susceptible to climates, to markets, to all types of changing things. And there's no group of businessmen that would celebrate a owner losing and making excuses for it. We can have empathy for the reason why we're struggling, but our mission and our purpose is that we dedicate ourselves to overcoming. And any businessman that's worth his salt will apply himself, and those that see him doing that will rally around him to advance so that he might attain the goal. But we cannot say, oh, the reason why it's failing is because of the economy or because of this or because of that, because the reality is the guys that are sitting with you are facing the same challenges. So if you have failed, please don't feel condemnation around it. I'm just, pre- I'm just challenging us on this point. is saying that we have been called by God to advance. So the evidence of what's happening in the world, we do share a responsibility in it. Because the king has decided, you shall be my disciples. Is that not so? He said to you to take and to go. So here's 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 8. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Sound familiar? For people will be lovers of self. I don't want to volunteer for this. It's going to cost me time. It's going to be, I don't like other people's children. <laughs> lovers of, sorry, I'll say that out loud. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. That doesn't happen at all. My child is an absolute angel. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good. We see this, the not loving good is is the most undervalued great evil of our time. Loving the things that God hates. And we're now seeing believers, churches, pastors, actually underlining and celebrating the things that God hates. Woe to those. Having the appearance of God in us, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weep women. Burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. Always learning. Always learning. I'm sure there was a point here. Always learning and never able to arrive at knowledge of the truth. There's a strong key here. If your learning is not reproducing action, your learning is inaccurate. You must put this tension on yourself. This is why the world is saying, shame, don't let the kids feel bad if they lose. Why? Because if they understand, if they are trained that what they do doesn't matter, they will never do anything that matters. And you and I are called to matter. 
Just as Jonas and Jobus opposed Moses, to those men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. We must be consuming the word. If you would consider your day and there is nothing of God's word going in directly, I actually mean not daily time with Jesus' books. I've got no problem with that. I've got no problem with us reading great authors like Charles Spurgeon and all these guys that are dead. I believe they've got great depth. But the reality is this, that when we are consuming God's word, it is the direct infusion that we need for what God has called us to do. And what the cultural bias has trained us previously is you don't, you can't do this by yourself. You need a pastor. You need an intermediary to be able to explain this, to feed you so that there's a hope that maybe you would succeed. The significance of me standing here should be in encouraging that you do not need me. You need Christ, you need his word, you need his spirit, and you need to get out there and do whatever you need to do. And I serve you with whatever it is so that you might attain the goal and you might finish strong. So what do we need? We need number three, which is to be humble. This is really hard. And so I'll use an analogy for this, or not an analogy, just a saying, because it's, it's something that we don't even like to consider this. But we need to let humiliation become our friend. Consider that for a moment. Will you allow yourself to be humiliated? One of the greatest goals we have in this world, fueled by the enemy, is self-preservation. And what has Christ called us to do in the flesh so that we might live in the, to die? Yeah, but it doesn't really mean, the last time I checked, in any language, dead is do it. <laughs> it's like, it's done. And so whatever is in my human nature that opposes God, I can no longer say, ach ja, maar jy, jy jere ken my heart. He knows, yes, he does. That's why Jesus died, so that you could partner with him to die also, so that he might resurrect you in the new life. So here's a cool thing, a little bit. Humiliation is only a feeling. It can do nothing to you. Isn't it true? When last has humiliation done you physically, bodily harm? Its only power is that you let it determine outcome. Consider the, the, the risk that you would want to take in something and then five years later somebody else is doing it and they're just winning. And now you have this challenge of envy and bitterness and resentment. Consider what was the cause of that humiliation. I don't want to say. So now you're feeling really bad. And that's the enemy doing that work. Now if we read our Bibles, we'll know that. Take every what captive? Every feeling and emotion captive. To who? Surrender it to the king. This is the way that I feel. Lord, God help me because it's contrary to your word, but you've said that you'll heal me, you'll restore me. It's one of the major pillars in this church. If you are bound, I mean, I'll give you some of my resume here. You, you probably might not find it very inspiring, but fear of hearts, delivered. No longer fear of hearts. So bound with depression that I could barely get to work. Gone, done, dusted. Colorblind, short-sightedness, asthma. Those prick things that they do here for allergy testing. They stood up so over here, if you had hair left, no longer a meal. But if you had, I could comb your hair for you. Delivered, healed. So if you stuck with stuff emotionally bound, I'm not saying we can help you, but I'm saying that there's biblical truths in this church that we've committed to that we're the beneficiaries of, which is where the sayings come from that are saying that we need to be the primary beneficiaries of the faith we proclaim so that we, the ones that are living free, can advance those that are bound to be free also. Makes sense. Do 
Humility is not, and I repeat, not somebody with low self-esteem. This is something that we often do not realize. Humility is the evidence of somebody that is very close to actually having a good self-worth. Because when I cannot be humble, what I'm actually revealing is my identity, my value, and my worth is derived from something else. And if this thing is revealed, I will be seen as a failure and my house of cards will fall to the ground. Humility is not, I repeat, not a person with low self-esteem. Humility is best reflected in the face of those who identify, whose identity is well-grounded. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. And that's not today. That's not tomorrow. That's 15 years, 20 years time when you look back and you see you divorced maybe, lost your business, whatever the case may be. Why is this? And again, we face another challenge. I'm a failure. This is the strategy of the enemy to keep people that have been bought with a price in chains. So whatever position you find yourself, your freedom is not in your past, it's in your future, committing to God and Him resurrecting you. Amen? Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with, with the humble is wisdom. They are literally polar opposites. You cannot and will not grow in the things of God with pride. We must condition ourselves to walk humbly. So who wants God to show them what is right and teach them his ways? Who wants that? I wonder where we'll find this insight. Right here. Psalm 25, 9. He leads the humble in what is right And he teaches the humble his way. So if you want to know what's right and you want to know, then where would we start? Say again. We'd start with God and actually asking him, do I need to adjust here with some humility? Because what I'm doing is I'm opening the channel so that I might actually be able to receive what is right And that God would teach me. Because what does the Bible also say? Whether I'm aware of it or unaware of it, he resists who? He resists the prideful. How many of us are asking God for things and it's silence? Don't put up your hands, please. (laughs) I need the faith here. Keep your hands down. I hope that this is landing on something positive here and that you're not just allowing the enemy to destroy you and eat you up like cancer. You can go do something about this. There's no reason why you cannot advance because you also have us that will rally with you. Any person that's prepared to take personal responsibility for their life, I am proud of you and fight with you. And any person that ridicules you for that, I will help hold them down. Why? Because the enemy is then moving through those people. And what does God say? Get thee behind me, Satan. You take responsibility for your life. We as an eldership and as a team of leaders will rally around you to support you as you lay hold of everything. That's all, folks. That God has (laughs) for you. Humility is pleasing to God. So the fourth one, application. And this is something that I've shared with with Wyatt when he asked me, what is success? It is the difference between knowing and doing. And this is the last point. What is success? It is the difference between knowing and doing. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 13. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. We need to start actually embracing adversity. Not for adversity's sake, but it's come to prove the good work that's been done in you. How will you know you will be able to endure? 
Cleet said this the one day, and he said, how can you call yourself an overcomer if you have not overcome anything? It, it, it's, a, it's a lie. We must, we must be overcomers. But in order for us to overcome, we need to be tried and tested. Those soldiers standing next to the bench, how battle ready are they? How long have they been standing there guarding that bench? So here's six things that you can take away with you, just practically. First one, set a goal. Consider carefully when you set the goal what it's going to cost you. Because like those New Year's resolutions, it's easy parking on the chair with popcorn in one hand and a Coke in the other and whispers to go that we're going to start this dive come the first. But we haven't counted the cost. Count the cost. That is part of setting the goal. What is it going to cost? Where are you going to put in the time? What are you going to give up? Set a goal. The second one, write it down. That's not the second one. But as you set the goal, write it down. Rush to somebody that will hold you accountable. Why? Because you will lack courage at some point. And if you have pride, you'll say, no, no, that's fine. I'll do it by myself. I'm just saying. Because I want you to win. Team is crucial. So that accountability is don't make the burden theirs. Have you done your homework? Sis, yeah. You say to them, I'm going to come to you in two weeks' time. And if you don't come to them in two weeks' time, don't phone them in third week and say, you never came and found me. Be responsible. Nobody sounds like that. Sorry, that's just my, I need a drink of water. This is you being responsible for your life. You go to them, even if it's week three and four and five and six, you drop the ball, you come before them and you say, I dropped the ball. Please, will you stick with me? I'll give that guy another 100 times. Even over 10 years, I'll give that guy another go. Why? Because at some point, he catches a wake up. And like that servant that was forgiven, surely I can forgive that person 77 times seven in a day or whatever it is. So even if a guy commits and he falls and he fails and he falls and he fails, I'll give him another go. So long as he is putting the burden of responsibility or she on herself and not blaming this one or me or the sky or whatever it is. Take responsibility. Why? It's crucial because if you're blaming, the enemy has you. And I will have no work with you because the Lord resists the prideful. So I have got a lot of work to do in my own life and around here, which means if we are committing to pride, God must deal with you first. Because I do not want God as an adversary. I think I have enough things in my own life where that is already taking effect. God help me. Number three, acquire what you need. Number four, work it out. Find Find things that you can test what you have applied, whether it's one sentence or two or three, whatever it is, find those areas that you can work it out. Number five, test it. Then with the scripture taking effect, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. That is the process of the testing. And if God is working on our hearts with humility, we don't mind failing because we just get to go again. Why? Because humiliation is just a feeling. doesn't mean that it can't debilitate us. But when we're busy believing those lies and we're bound by humiliation, hopefully you'll remember this line. Keith said it's just a feeling. Let me test it. Can I still move? Can I still dance? Can I still? Yes. All righty. What should I commit to? And then six, when it's working, Celebrate it. We don't like to celebrate, but celebrate it. Why? Because it will give hope and courage to others. Amen. So I'll give you those six, six, six things and then close again. First one was set a goal. Two, be as accountable. Three, acquire what you need. Four, work it out. Five, test it. And six, celebrate it. And so a condition for heart, I think I'd end with that in saying this. Do not be afraid to fail. Failure is inevitable. 
If you've lived to this time, whatever age you're on, you haven't failed yet, you are an anomaly. Failure is inevitable, but so is success if we apply ourselves. Amen. Father, just thank you for the opportunity that your word gives us what we need. You inspire us, you lead us, you guide us. And so, Father, I pray for hope and for courage for those that sit here this morning. Whatever it is that we are stuck with in our hearts and our minds now of what we feel we need to overcome, Father, the burden, the oppression that the enemy would want to leave us with, the guilt, the shame, the condemnation, whatever that is, Father God, right now where they're sitting, I give them an opportunity to agree with you and not with Satan against them. And so, Father God, we commit our hearts and our minds to you where we say the enemy would want to determine the outcome of where we stuck or where we failed. We repent for inclining our ear to him. And we say this morning, Father God, we choose to commit to you in your leading and your guiding of our life. Thank you that we do not do it alone. We have your Holy Spirit. We have your word, word and we have each other. And so, Father, we celebrate what you're going to do in our lives. And I pray for a period of grace for those who are ready for this challenge to advance. Father, that they would hear you clearly and the negativity, the enemy's words would die down so that there would be a period of grace for them to lay hold of hope and truth and advance in all that you have for them. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.